Hey family, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. Bring greetings from Miami. Know that the church and the leadership in Calvary Chapel, Miami, they're praying for you. They're praying for this conference. And it's always a blessing to be able to see the family of God joined together in Kenya, all over the United States. It's always an enormous blessing. But we'll read 1 Peter chapter 5. And for you that you think you're not a church leader or a pastor or elder, it's still a great portion for us to go over because now you know what a church leader or a church pastor should look like and should live like. And I hope even as a result of this conference that God would put a calling upon your life to become a shepherd or a leader or a church planter. I was just talking to a gentleman earlier, he's from Mombasa, and he says that there's no Bible-based churches there. And I know Kenya, does Kenya need more Bible-based churches? Yes, it does. Miami, Florida, the United States needs more Bible-based churches. So it'll be good for us to go over it. We'll read verse 1 through 5, and then we'll pray. It says, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this blessing, this privilege to come here and worship you, to be able to be joined with the body of Christ and to be able to put Jesus, you at the center and your word at the center of our time together. We ask that, Holy Spirit, you would work in us, help me to rightly divide your word, Lord, and help each and every one of us to rightly apply your word in our lives, Lord. We love you and we thank you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Peter begins and he says, the elders who are among you, I exhort. He could have said, I command, I demand, but he uses this word exhort, which is to call someone to your side and then to encourage them and urge them to go down a certain course of action. It's to bring someone alongside of you, very near to you, and then give them strength, give them spirit, and give them courage to go out and to do something. It's to have someone in your life that you love and they wrap their arm around your shoulder And they bring you near to give you encouragement and advice in what to do in life. It's not simply a commandment, hey, you go over there and do that while I stay over here. You Kenyans, most of you seem very fit. In America, there's a lot less fit people. We need physical education for our kids. Our kids don't know how to be physical, so they literally have to be educated on how to be physical how to go out and run and do things. And I'll never forget when I was in phys education, physical education in middle school, my coach was over 350 pounds. I don't know how much that is in kilos, but it's a lot. It's a lot. And we would have to go and run miles. We, he would send us to go run miles, but he would follow us on a cart. He would follow us on a tuk-tuk. He would send all the kids to run and he would just follow us while he's sitting down, very full, very big, and he'd send all the kids, you go out and you go run miles. And that usually doesn't work for us. If your father was a lazy man and wasted all the money on drugs and alcohol and he sent you to go out and work, it doesn't settle well within us. And here Peter, he sets a good example. He doesn't just say, hey, I command you, you go and do this, and I'm going to do my own thing. He brings all the elders, he puts his arms around their shoulders, and he says, guys, I'm exhorting you, I'm encouraging you to go out and do something. And in verses 2 through 4, we see three main points to these four verses. 
He's going to encourage them on what the goal of the ministry is. He's going to encourage them and let them know what their goal is as a minister of Jesus Christ. And finally, he's going to warn them of the great judgment day for, of Jesus Christ. And for those of you, those of us who are pastors or church leaders, that judgment day, we should be more concerned about it because we'll read later on how we will be held to a stricter judgment. You pastor, you elder, you leader, we will be held to a stricter judgment than everyone else for the rest of eternity. We are called to lead by example, to lead by sharing life with others. Jesus didn't come and wait on the top of the mountain and go tell the disciples what to go out and do. He shared life with them. And Peter here demonstrates the true heart of biblical leadership. He writes to the elders. And how does Peter identify himself? Your fellow elder. Peter doesn't say, listen to me, I'm Apostle Peter. Listen to me, I'm the first Pope Peter. I am most holy Peter. I am water walker Peter. He doesn't say anything like that. Do any of you have apostles here in Kenya? We have many apostles in the U.S. too. And none of them are apostles. None of them. Peter, he truly is an apostle. He walked with Jesus. He saw the bread multiplied, the fish multiplied. It was him, James, and John seeing Jesus transfigured. And yet he says, I'm just like the rest of you. I am just your fellow elder. Some leaders want to put as much distance between themselves and the people they serve with or work with. But we don't see Jesus doing this. Jesus didn't command the disciples to go out and run and he followed them on the tuk-tuk. He ran with them. He walked with them. He taught them. He instructed them. He loved them and he rebuked them. Jesus Christ, yes, he spent time alone in prayer. He spent time alone in the wilderness, time alone on the mountain, time alone on the cross. But so much of his ministry was with the people he cared about and the people he loved. Do you see the great blessing, the influence that you have as a church leader, an elder, a deacon, to influence others in their maturity and growth in Jesus Christ? Do you take this something that's light or do you take this as a heavy burden to know that others, even as Ken mentioned, the mark of a father, if I'm a good father or bad father, it will change the way my sons and daughters look at their heavenly father. And those of you who are pastors here, the way you treat the people in your flock will change the way those people view Jesus Christ and God the Father. It is a heavy weight for us. So may we do it like Jesus Christ did it, doing it together with the three, with the 12, with the 70, and all the other disciples that were with him. Charles Spurgeon, he said this, it will always be our wisdom, dear friends, to put ourselves as much as we can into the position of those whom we address. It is a pity for anyone to ever preach down to people. It is always better to be as nearly as possible on the same level as they are. You see, we are all beggars showing other beggars where the bread of life is. That's all we're doing. No one is more special. No one is more holy. Some of us are just given more weight than others. We can be reminded of Jesus' style of ministry in John 13, verse 14, 14 through 17. Jesus says, If I then, your Lord and teacher, I've washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus, being our leader, our Lord, our Savior, our champion, 
our Messiah and teacher, if he took on the lowest role of a slave, how much more should we serve the people in our churches? How much more should we? Jesus wants us, and he set a pattern for us to be humble and to desire to serve the people that walk amongst us. A church leader is called to be a servant to God's servants. We are called to be servants to God's servants. Just as Jesus said he didn't come into the world to be served, but to serve. And as leaders, we will only be blessed, as Jesus said in verse 17, if you do them. If you do them. To love the Bible is important, but we must apply it to our lives. If we only read and read and read, it will help, but it only grows us if we apply it and begin to do it. Another portion of scripture that demonstrates Jesus' leadership is in Matthew 20, verse 25 through 28. Jesus says, the rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come into the world to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Pastor, are you telling the people how much to tithe? Are you telling them how much to give? Are you exercising authority over their life? Or are you leading by your service? Once again, consider the ministry and the life of Jesus Christ. How he gave and he gave and he gave. He served and he served and he served. We were speaking about it this morning in our group devotionals. We have a group of missionaries here from the United States. And Jesus, after hearing that John the Baptist, his own cousin, was beheaded, and after the 70 disciples come back from their missionary journey, he says, let us go to the other side and rest a while. And yet it says that he sees the multitudes gathering on the Sea of Galilee, and they all came to him. And what does Jesus do? Does he say, hey, all of you must serve me? All of you were closed for business. I'm not going to speak to you. Notice he was moved with compassion for them. He was moved with love for them because they were sheep without a shepherd. As pastors, as leaders, we must be moved with compassion. Not with envy, not with illusions of grandeur, not with power, not with authority. We must be moved just as Jesus was moved by compassion. Peter tells them, the elders who are among you, I exhort... I, who am your fellow elder. And this idea of elders, it's been around since the book of Exodus. In Exodus 3.16, Exodus 12.21, Exodus 19.7, God tells Moses to raise up elders among him to help him with the load of the flock that he's caring for. This word elder, it speaks of maturity and the wisdom that an older person should have. Now, do all older people have wisdom and discernment? Absolutely not. There are many older people that we know that they have zero biblical wisdom or instruction. It's speaking more about the level of wisdom and maturity a man has more than a specific age. This elder, this bishop, this overseer is someone who's to be a manager entrusted over a certain section, whether it's a certain state or city or ministry within a church. How do you become an elder? Just grow in the wisdom and the love of God. In John 15, Jesus tells us in verse 4, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit in and of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And if you desire that work of an elder or a bishop, Paul tells Timothy, you desire a good work. And all it requires is for you to grow in maturity and love and faithfulness to Jesus Christ. And different people mature at different ages and at different rates. Some mature very quickly, and others mature very slowly. 
But it's all connected to the time we spent abiding with Jesus Christ. And just because you're an elder or a pastor doesn't mean now we stop abiding with Jesus Christ. All of a sudden, just because we're doing church work doesn't mean that we need to spend time in our Bible for ourselves as fathers, as husbands, abiding with Jesus Christ. Like Troy mentioned yesterday, the only thing holding us back from an incredible relationship with Jesus Christ is ourselves. He promises us in James 4 verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And our God, he's in the habit of maturing young men quickly, but he doesn't disregard the elderly among us either. He uses the Joshuas, the Davids, the Samuels, and the Johns, but he also uses the Abrahams, the Moseses, the Calebs, and the Peters. So I don't know if any of you are 100 years old, but God can still use you. He can still use you. If any of you are here and you're six years old, your mother having to sew your own priestly outfit every year, hey, God, he wants to use you. So Peter, he identifies himself as a fellow elder, and as a witness and partaker of Christ's glory and of Christ's suffering. Peter says, guys, I'm qualified to speak to you because I'm an elder just like you. But I've also witnessed Jesus Christ being crucified, and I've also witnessed Jesus Christ being glorified in his true state there on the Mount of Transfiguration. So Peter, he's pulled the elders close to him, He's put his arm around them, and then he gives them these three things to be weary of. The goal of the ministry, their goal as ministers, and the great day of judgment. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you. And this is the goal of the ministry. This is the goal of our churches as church leaders. It's to shepherd God's people and shepherd God's flock. Now, is a shepherd the only job that works with animals? No, there are many jobs that work with animals. Notice he didn't say, ranch the flock of God that is among you. Because a rancher, do they really care about the the flock or the cattle? No, they want to sell it. That's all they care about. Getting them healthy enough to sell them. You know who else works with sheep a lot? Butchers. Butchers work with sheep a lot. But they're all dead. They're all dead. He's chopping them up. He sees lamb chops. He sees leg of lamb. He sees lamb shoulder. We are called to shepherd his people. Not to use his people for our own gain. We're called to shepherd them. And then for us to notice whose flock is it. It's not my flock. It's not Josh's flock. It's the flock of God. And one day we will be judged for it. And there are many shepherds throughout Scripture. You have Abel, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, David, Amos, Zechariah. They were all shepherds. And Scripture tells us David was the great king of Israel. And he learned how to be the great king when he was shepherding his father's flock. We need to care for the people. We can turn to John 21. And I can imagine Peter thinking of this very moment in his life as he's, as he's encouraging the fellow elders to shepherd the flock of God among them. John chapter 21. John 21. Peter, he's at his lowest point. And maybe you're here as a pastor an elder, a church leader, and you're realizing you're doing everything wrong. I I encourage you, as we've been praying for repentance, what greater man to repent and be an example than a pastor or an elder or a leader to realize you've been doing things wrong. Peter messed up completely. He denied his Lord three times just as his Lord told him and just as his Lord warned him. But the, the heart of the Father... The heart of the son is to restore. In John 21 verse 15, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. 
And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. We don't have time to go through all the Greek. We're focused here on the shepherd. But a shepherd had two priorities to take care of a flock. The first thing is to feed the sheep. The shepherd needs to find the right land, the right pasture, and the right water source for the sheep to be able to be healthy. And now the next goal and priority for a shepherd is to tend the sheep. That word tend, it's to protect the sheep. It is to guide the sheep. It is to nurture the sheep and to care for the sheep of the flock of God. And my brothers here, what is your priority within the ministry? If we would take all of your teachings, what are the words that come out the most? Is it truly feeding his sheep? Because guess what? They are not our sheep. And one day we will be held accountable for every word that we've shared. We are called to feed the sheep and to tend to the sheep. And there's only one thing that feeds God's sheep. It's the word of God. There's only one thing that will transform and renew their minds. It's the word of God. There's only one thing that will wash them and cleanse them from this world and the things they've been through. It's the word of God. There's only one thing that will mature them. It's the word of God. There's only one thing that will reveal their very thoughts and the intentions of our wicked hearts. And it is the word of God. Is God's word the priority of our ministries or not? In Acts 20, verse 28, it says, To shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The sheep, they come at a great price. This flock that has been entrusted to our care, it cost the father his very greatest possession. The thing most important to him, the perfect blood of his innocent son. And does that come to our account as we treat the flock among us, as we're loving to them and gracious to them? Do we consider the great price of this flock? And do we consider that he was willing to lay down his life for the flock and for the sheep? And now he's entrusted them into our care for a season. In John 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not a shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming, and he leaves the sheep, and he flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling, and he does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. Brothers, are we laying our lives down for the sheep? Are we laying our lives down for the flock? We were at a pastor's conference in California a few months ago, and Pastor Don McClure, he was just giving a a story and an analogy that when they were young pastors at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, He didn't realize, but they were all just a bunch of kids playing on this playground while Chuck Smith was fending off all the wolves, fighting off all the wicked doctrines, fighting off all the wolves that would want to come into the church and preach their own gospels or their own doctrines. And if you're a father, if you're a parent here, you know what that's like. You're you're walking around paying attention. You're looking at the hands of men to see what's going on. You're looking at demeanor and your wife, your children, they're oblivious to what's going on. Completely oblivious. And as pastors, the church is not our playground. It's not for us to come and enjoy and play and have fun. Now, do we enjoy? Do we have fun? Absolutely. 
Do we joke around? Is it enjoyable? Absolutely. But the flock, it is the people we love and the people we are to care for. Fighting off the wolves that come, making sure they're fed, making sure the sanctuary is a peaceful place for them to come and lay down and listen to God's word and be renewed just as we were once renewed. Then he says, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And as a minister, this is my goal. This is our goal. This is who we are to be. We are to be that man who serves, not by compulsion, but willingly. Serving not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not lording over those entrusted to our care, but being an example to the flock. This is our goal as ministers. That word overseer, it's where we get our word bishop. That comes from the Greek culture, and it's a manager, a supervisor, someone who carefully inspects, carefully oversees, and looks for and cares for a certain area within the ministry. And at some point, some within the church fell in love with this title of a bishop. And why do we become, why do we fall in love with titles? Because of the pride of our heart. You see, if a bishop is just a manager, when you go to the butcher and something is wrong, do you ask for the bishop of the butcher? When you go to the Java house and they get your coffee wrong, do you ask to speak with the bishop? No, it's just a manager. And yet we look for things to blow up our ego. We are all servants. We are doulos, slaves of Jesus Christ. If you're just chasing after titles, be warned. Jesus warns us in Luke 20, verse 45 through 47. He says, beware of the scribes, those who desire to go around with long robes, those who love the greetings in the marketplaces, those who love the best seats in the synagogues and the best places at the feasts. Those who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, these will receive greater condemnation. Be careful if you're just chasing the titles, the power, the position. Be very careful. Jesus says these will receive a greater condemnation. Instead of chasing after the title of a bishop, we should be reminded what are the qualifications of a bishop? How should a bishop be living? What should my life look like? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 2, he says, If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. He's honest. It takes work to be a bishop. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Ken already said, if you're a polygamist here, you're off. You can't be a bishop. Husband of one wife. Temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, and able to teach. In Titus, he says that he's not to be self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-control, holding fast, to the faithful word as he's been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine to both exhort and convict those who contradict. And again, if you're here and you're saying, well, I am failing as a bishop, Peter completely failed. The Lord, he wants to restore you, but restoration can only happen if we repent, if there's true repentance. Then he says that we are to serve not with compulsion, but willingly. That word compulsion, it's being forced or constrained to go out and be in the ministry. And no one should feel as if they've been forced into the ministry, that they have to be there. Maybe it's because of financial difficulty or because another person pushed you to be in the ministry. Instead, we are all to volunteer. Say, Lord, I give my life to be in the ministry voluntarily of our own will and our own accord saying, Lord, I volunteer to serve and lay my life down for the flock. 
F.B. Meyer, he says, none of God's soldiers are mercenaries or pressed men. They are all volunteers. We must have a shepherd's heart if we would do a shepherd's work. And Jesus was never forced to do anything. In fact, in John 10, 18, he says, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. Jesus volunteered his own life. And as pastors, as church leaders, as elders, we are to volunteer saying, I lay my life down. Just because you've graduated from a school or a Bible college doesn't mean you should be in the ministry. Just because another pastor or church leader, just because your mama told you to be in the ministry doesn't mean you should be in the ministry. We must be called and then we must volunteer to lay our lives down for the flock. Then he says, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. And, and we see it here in Kenya. It's no different in the United States. Men that are in the ministry to take from the flock. They, they're butchers. They're asking widows. They're asking people that are going to bed hungry that night to tithe over and over and over again. They pass the bucket one time. They count it. It's not enough. Let's do it again. They're butchers. They're not shepherds. They're not caring for you or feeding widows or caring for orphans. They're looking at the sheep as lamb chops, lollipops, leg of lamb. And if that's you here, be careful. Isaiah 56, 11, it says, They are greedy dogs which never have enough. They are shepherds who cannot understand. They all look to their own way, everyone for his own gain and for his own territory. Brothers, be careful. Be careful. We must all repent. And we're all greedy of it. Maybe there's that church member and they're seven feet and you want them on your basketball team in the church ministry. You're looking, hey, what can I get out of them? What can I get from them? Be careful with this. It's, Lord, what can I give to this individual? How can I bless them? How can I bless their family, their marriage, their children? Pastor, what is the focus of your ministry? What is the priority? If you're constantly asking for money, if you're constantly asking for people to bow down to you and to bless you and give you things, I warn you, perhaps you've lost the focus and the goal of the ministry, that we voluntarily lay our lives down because we are blown away that Jesus would lay his life down for a sinner like me. Finally, verse 3, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you. That word Lord is to have control. It's to try to hold someone in subjection. To try to master people with an air of being superior to them. Do you walk above the rest of your flock? Do you puff your chest out and look down at all of them? Or do we, like Jesus, get down on the knee and wash their feet? You see, if there's one thing Jesus Christ hates, it's when men and women get in the middle of him and his people. He hates that. And if you're acting as if you're the prophet and all of the flock needs to come to you before they can hear from the Lord, be very careful. 1 Timothy 2.5 says there's only one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And if you're here and you've been hurt by the ministry, know that that angers me. I hate that. If you've been here and you've been abused, a, a youth pastor, a pastor took advantage of you. I hate that because it gives a bad name to the ministry. It gives a bad name to the church. It gives a bad name even to Jesus Christ. But Jesus hates this. In Revelation 2 verse 6, he says, But this you do have, church, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And the Nicolaitans, they were known as veil builders. They believed that they were better than the flock and they would be the connection in their minds between God and God's people. As pastors, we're to uphold the word and uphold Jesus Christ. We're not Jesus Christ to anyone. Teach the people how to follow Jesus. Don't teach them how to follow you. And if you're a pastor to pastors, teach them how to pastor others. Teach them how to lead others 
to Jesus Christ. Remember, it's not my flock. It's not your flock. I didn't die for them. You didn't die for them. It's the flock of Jesus Christ. He says, be an example to them. Are we living our life as an example, a good example to the flock? Because we will all be examples. We will all be that pattern that we put upon the flock. Pastors, how's your marriage? Is your marriage a good marriage? If every marriage at the church was like your marriage, how would your marriage ministry look like? Pastors, does everybody tithe like you do? Does everybody love their kids like you do? Does everybody worship like you do? We are an example. And Paul told Timothy to be an example to believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. You see, I love Jesus Christ because he always led by example. He never told us, hey, you go and do this, and I'll sit back. And as pastors, as leaders, we need to lead by example. And know that the church will take on the strengths and the weaknesses of its pastor, of its church leaders. If you're hospitable, your flock will be hospitable. If you love to worship God, your flock will love to worship God. If you're stingy, the flock will be stingy. If you're mean-spirited, the flock will be mean-spirited. If you gossip and talk bad about the flock, the flock, they'll gossip and talk bad about you. It happens. They're going to act like us. Their strengths and their weaknesses are going to be bigger than our own strengths and weaknesses. Finally, we have the reminder of the great judgment day. Verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. One of my favorite studies is in Revelation when John sees Jesus in his true state. John, the, the, the disciple that Jesus loved. John, the disciple that felt comfortable enough to lay his head on the chest of Jesus Christ. I don't know how many people you're comfortable with putting your head on their chest. I don't know how many people you're comfortable with them putting their head on your chest, all right? But John was so close to Jesus, he would lay his head on his chest. And yet when he saw Jesus in his true state, he said he fell on his face as dead. Oftentimes we think of Jesus only as the carpenter. We think of Jesus only as that man from Galilee. But I encourage you, read Revelation 1 and 2. It is a scary thing to consider who Jesus Christ truly is today. He veiled his true glory for those 33 years, but now no more. He is that lion from the tribe of Judah. And when he appears, he will judge us. If we've been that good example, if we've shepherded them, if we've laid down our life for them, we will gain an extra crown of victory for our service that will not fade away. Jesus, he's the chief pastor. He is the good shepherd, and he will come back and ask each pastor and church leader, how did you treat my flock? How did you teach my flock? How did you love my flock? Let's turn to Luke chapter 12. And Jesus answers a question with a question and a parable with a parable as he would often do. And in Luke chapter 12, verse 41, after speaking many parables, Peter asks Jesus, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us? Or to all people. Then he says in verse 42. Who then is that faithful and wise servant. Whom his master will make ruler over his household. To give them their portion of food in due season. Blessed is that servant. Whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart. My master delays his coming and begins to beat 
the male and female servants, and to eat and to drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, at an hour when he is not aware, and he will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, from him they will ask the more. The good news is that you've come to a conference where God's word is being shared. The bad news, you're going to be held accountable for it. We'll all be held accountable for it. And how are we loving the flock? We see this servant was entrusted with the care of his master's possessions. But instead of caring for them, he fails in three ways in verse 45. First, he doesn't live in a ready state of Christ's return. He says, Jesus, he's going to come back later on. He'll come at the end of the millennium. He'll come at the end of the tribulation. He'll come in the middle of the tribulation. He's not living with an eminent return of Jesus Christ. And we need to live ready for his return at any moment. Living with a good conscience with how we're living. Secondly, he doesn't care about his fellow servants. He doesn't care about them. He begins to beat them. He begins to hurt the other servants of Jesus Christ. And finally, what's the third way he failed? He embraces the pleasures of this world. He embraces the food, the gluttony, the drink, the wine, the drunkenness. And pastors, we need to repent. There's no doubt there are some of you that are watching pornography or cheating on your spouse or taking from the church or taking from widows or orphans. We need to repent. Perhaps you need to repent of your pride. Somebody at church called you out and you said, who in the world are you to call me out? We need to repent of our pride as well. And we need to know to whom much is given from him, much will be required. In James chapter 3 verse 1, he warns us, Let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. In Mark chapter 9 verse 42, he warns, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble... It would be better for him if he would tie a millstone around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. You see, Jesus, he cares for his flock deeply. Pastor, elder, we're part of that flock. That's a strange thing. We are a sheep and a shepherd at the same time. But he cares and he loves his flock so much. Jesus, he will ask each and every one of us, did you feed them? And if you're a father here, if you're a big brother here, he's going to ask you, did you feed that little flock that I entrusted to your care? There's only one thing that feeds them. It's not our antics. It's not how loud we get. It's not our handkerchiefs or how much sweat we take off. It is his word alone that feeds the flock. He will ask you, how did you tend to my flock? How did you protect them? How did you nurture them? How did you care for them? How did you guide the people that I entrusted to your care? If we do well, if we were faithful with whatever number he allotted to us, whether five or 500, we will receive that crown. You see, God, he's not going to judge us based on the size. He judges us based on our faithfulness. So be faithful. Don't be looking for the next teaching opportunity. Don't be looking for the next flock or the bigger group of people to teach. Be faithful in the little things. If we did well, we will receive that crown that will never fade away. And it's another tangible thing we can give back to our Lord and Master as a thank you for all that he's done for us. We must feed and tend to his sheep because they were purchased by his blood so brothers, remember the goal of the ministry. We're not a rancher and we're not a butcher. We are a shepherd who lays our life down for the flock. And remember, 
the great judgment day. One last scripture before we close. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. One of the scariest portions of scripture. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So if you're that pastor or elder today and you're saying, I'm trying to do these things, praise God. Keep praying. He will strengthen you to hold the line and be faithful to him. If you're that pastor, that leader, and you've realized you got an F, you failed, hey, repent. He wants to grow you and welcome you and love you as he did with Peter. If you're here and perhaps God has put a burden on your heart, again, all of Kenya needs more Bible-based churches. And if you're here and you've been hurt by church, I encourage you, let go of that bitterness, forgive them, and know God himself will judge that individual. And his judgment is the best judgment. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. And Lord, thank you that there are, Lord, many bad examples. But Lord, thank you for the blessing of having so many good examples in our lives, Lord. Many men, Lord, that have laid their lives down for the flock. Lord, thank you for this blessing. Who are we? Lord, who are we that you would entrust us to share your truth or your word to your people, Lord? Who are we, Lord? Thank you that, Lord, you're so gracious to us. You're so merciful to us, God. And Lord, just pray that you'd continue to strengthen us over the course of this weekend, Lord, that each of us would go home, go back to our portions of Africa or our portions of America, Lord, and we would be better fathers and better sons and better mothers and daughters, pastors and church leaders, Lord. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done for us. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen.